Please assist me in welcoming Dr. Jaffe, who will be t discussing biodetox for healthful survival. Dr. Jaffe was honored as an international scientist of 2003 by the IBC, Oxford, England, and the UK for his lifetime contributions to clinical medicine, biochemistry, immunology, methodology, and integrative health policy. He currently serves on the American Board of Clinical Medical Toxicology and coordinates its certification training program. He's an author of over 100 articles, and he is the founder and director of PERC, who is also exhibiting at this meeting. Please welcome Dr. Jeffy. Thank you, and welcome back from lunch. Uh, it is a pleasure and a privilege to be back here. Um, for full disclosure, I've actually passed the baton in regard to the uh, board. Uh, someone else has uh, carry, doing the heavy lifting there. Uh, but my work continues to be uh, approaching physiology first. Uh, my disclosure is that I came to debunk but am now fully supported within the industry. So to the extent that I do have a financial interest in a product in my talk, which may or may not be, uh, but I do have an affiliation with companies offering grant monies for this continuing dental and medical education program, but I, I trust whatever that meant you got. <coughs> Anything but late for dinner, as far as I'm concerned. Before presenting about biological detoxification, before doing that, and even before briefly reviewing the last several presentations as an introduction to today, I have the pleasure of going to many meetings. There are very few meetings that I go to where I consistently learn something useful that I didn't know before. And I really want to thank Rich and Kim and all of you who put this program together because I think it's terrific and you should appreciate it. <laughs> With that, uh, as a pre-introduction, uh, the presentation is indeed on biodetoxification. And it's somewhat of a journalist narrative, not so much as a scientist or a clinician, but in this particular case, more as an observer. So I'm going to be telling you the story, and it has a who, what, where, when, how, why quality to it, which is why the question is, what synergies could we get if we appreciated the opportunity to work with nature first rather than last, if at all? What would happen if we used physiology first and our understanding of physiology and biochemistry? So our objectives for the presentation are to uh, review and then extend our understandings of how we can mobilize and more safely excrete toxic minerals and what are the interactions and does it really matter? Can we monitor and document outcomes so that we have an evidence base for anything that we do in practice? Well, we're going to be talking about the issue of complexing, which means picking up, then mobilizing, moving, and then safely excreting, because the fact that you pick up and move a toxic metal around does not necessarily mean that it's safe to do that, especially if you redeploy it, say, at the blood-brain barrier or the loop of Henle or the choroid plexus in the brain. Most of the presentation will be on biological detoxification. I will include the use of pulse D-penicillamine uh, where uh, appropriate. To review the uh, presentation from several years ago, ascorbate loves to scavenge toxic metals. Ascorbate loves to scavenge divalent cations. Ascorbate has, as you may remember, this unique property of having a hydroxyl that is vicinal, which means on the same side of this double bond, and that turns out to strain the bond in such a way that it has a unique reducing capacity. It also turns out that the geometry is such that doubly charged cations, divalent cations like lead or mercury, can be bound to ascorbate. And then as physical chemists, we'd like to know what the relative affinity is, and it does get more complicated in biological solutions, but generally ascorbate prefers lead, then mercury, then arsenic, then cadmium, nickel, beryllium, calcium, copper, magnesium, and zinc. 
<clears throat> what this led us to was the understanding that you could use D-penicillamine as a provocative agent to assess the body burden of both beneficial, nutritional, essential minerals as well as toxic minerals. And I'll talk later in the presentation about the D-penicillamine provocation. Another contribution we were able to make was to ask the question, if ascorbate likes to bind and safely move and protect in the excretion of these toxic metals, how much toxic metal could a gram of ascorbate bind? It turns out that a gram of ascorbate is about five millimoles. Just doing the math, that comes out to a million micrograms. And I can go through this with any of you who want the details, but about 0.1%. So a very small fraction of ascorbate is able to bind the toxic metals because ascorbate does lots of other things. So when you do the conservative math, you find out <clears throat> that a gram of ascorbate binds about a tenth of a micromole of mercury, and that translates into about 20 micrograms per day. So the first gram or two of ascorbate that you take can basically cover the flux or the normative uh, toxic metal uh, exposures. So that's what we conclude is that a gram mobilizes about 10 micrograms of toxic mineral <clears throat> per gram of ascorbate per day. So the first two grams of ascorbate that people take in a day on an average person, whoever that average person is, would be enough to manage their daily exposure to toxic metals. So this doesn't yet give you enough ascorbate to get rid of a prior burden, but it does give you enough ascorbate to manage the daily turnover and exposure. So the evidence is that ascorbate mobilizes toxic metals. There is a daily toxic mineral exposure. About two grams of ascorbate per day will safely protect and excrete the typical daily flux or the daily turnover. Ascorbate needs vary. From, from person to person. I know that Linus Pauling originally said four grams, then he said nine grams, then he said 18 grams, but I had the pleasure of asking him why, and he said, because doctors cannot understand anything except an absolute number. Now, I believe that today we have made a little progress, which means we can understand that if faces and fingerprints are distinctive, and if hat sizes and shoe sizes are different, then maybe one size and nutrition won't fit all. And now the question is, how much ascorbate do you need in order to get to the same biologically beneficial ascorbate level. And ascorbate is interesting in that the half-life, how fast you use up the ascorbate, has more variance in vitamin C and ascorbate than in any other biological molecule. And this work actually goes back to Roger Williams, um, giant of the American Chemical Society, founder of the Clayton Medical Foundation, uh, whose book, the Beautiful, Your Beautiful World Within, is a classic, I think from the late 1950s. He pointed out that if you're a really healthy person, you'll use up half of your ascorbate in about a month. And if you're chronically unwell, or you have an autoimmune disease that's progressive, or you're symptomatic with a chronic degenerative disease, the half-life of ascorbate could be 30 minutes. So if you use up half your ascorbate in 30 minutes, that's very different than if you use half your ascorbate in 30 days. So if you use your ascorbate, use up half of it in 30 minutes, you're gonna need a lot of ascorbate to reach the same physiological level, the same beneficial protective level, as a person who is more conserving, has a half-life of 30 days, they might only need a couple of grams a day. So there is a more wide variation, there's a wider variation in ascorbate needs than of any other biological molecule. Another thing that you may have heard that I'd like to put in some context is that ascorbate is the molecule cells like most. So ascorbate is the most common molecule, biologically active molecule, I should say, in cells. And cells do something very interesting with ascorbate. They concentrate ascorbate 30-fold over plasma and will do so up to the level where the ascorbate precipitates in the cell. So you can get ascorbate uptake 30 times over plasma, which means a small change in the plasma translates into a big change in the cells. So plasma levels may be low, but 
a change of a tenth or two tenths or three tenths of a milligram per deciliter in plasma ascorbate translates into a 30 times greater increase in the cellular ascorbate. And this concentration 30-fold over plasma continues all the way up to the physical saturation. What that says in more common parlance is it sells like ascorbate and they never seem to get enough of it. So consumption is related, uh, half-life is related to consumption rate or daily need. People need different amounts to achieve the same biological activity. Here is some data on about uh, 3,200 people. The far left yellow, if you can actually see this, it's very narrow, these are the healthy people. <laughs> these are the people who were reasonably healthy, that's the dark blue. These are the people who are ambulatory, the, what I would refer to as the walking wounded. That's about 80% of your population. And then there's a tail out here in red of people who need an awful lot. If you could see, that begins at about 130 grams to calibrate. So this is the population that needs less than 4 grams. This is the group that needs 5 to 10. This is the group that needs 10 to 120 or 30, and this is the group that needs more than 130. Not many of these folks, but you will meet them in practice. These are the people who, if you suggest that they do an ascorbate calibration, which means taking ascorbate every 15 minutes, and we'll walk through the details in just a minute, there are some people who will tell you that they spent most of the day taking vitamin C, and they didn't flush. And I'll even tell you what to do about them. But it is interesting to us that you've got very distinct populations if you look at large numbers of people in regard to how much ascorbate it takes uh, for them to meet their daily needs. This is the same data. Uh, I've just uh, wanted to emphasize that the uh, typical population uh, calibrates with uh, more than 10 and less than 130 grams, not milligrams, a day. So ascorbate safely protects, it mobilizes, it complexes, and helps excrete toxic minerals. Generally, about 60% of the excretions in the urine, about 30% in the stool, and about 10% in the sweat. And I only mention that to remind you that physiology extends to all systems, and if you mobilize toxic metals into, say, the urine, you will probably also increase the excretion in the, in the stool uh, and in the sweat. Now, ascorbate does protect, but it also has some synergists. It also has some friends that it really likes. And it turns out that if you have healthy amounts of magnesium and zinc, you can displace toxic metals more easily. In fact, there's some evidence that if you have healthy levels of magnesium and zinc, and that makes you alkaline, that blocks the uptake of toxic metals. And the people who are exposed and take up much more toxic metals are the ones who are deficient in buffering minerals like magnesium and zinc, which means they have underlying metabolic acidosis. And I would suggest the underlying metabolic acidosis, the underlying oxidative stress and antioxidant deficits, and the third component, the underlying defects in methylation, are the antecedent causes. So it's not that everybody is susceptible to toxic metal uptake. It's the people who have impaired control systems that are and so if you can displace the toxic metals with magnesium and zinc and you're in a healthier alkaline state, you're relatively protected. What percentage of the population is in a healthier alkaline state? Does anybody know? 10. Lower than 10? Yeah, a couple of percent. Now, now we, could, you know, we could discuss about whether it's 2% or 5% or a half a percent. I'm taking a very casual definition of what healthy means, and we find about 2% pass that test. You could take a stricter definition and then fewer people would be healthy. When Hugh Reardon tried to find 100 healthy people in Wichita, Kansas, he advertised for over two years and they found 32 who were willing to come forward. There may have been some healthy people who didn't want to be tested, but they were offering thousands of dollars worth of free tests if you were asymptomatic by a certain questionnaire, the Cornell Medical Index. They had trouble finding 100 people. They wanted to do a study. The other point here is that you can complex other elements like sulfur sources in the diet and particularly selenomethionine or selenocysteine and that can help scavenge or soak up toxic metals. 
So we want to work with ascorbate to mobilize toxic metals. We want to be able to displace toxic metals if we can using alkaline uh, minerals like magnesium and zinc. And we want to enhance conjugation with sulfur and selenomethionine or other selenium uh, biological uh, compounds. Um, so there are multiple separate and interactive or synergistic ways of lowering the burden of toxic metals. What we really want to do is reduce oxidative stress. That's one of the three things that really will kill you. In order to reduce oxidative stress, you must have enough antioxidants. You can only have oxidative stress when you run out of one or more of the necessary antioxidants. Ascorbate is the central recycling antioxidant. The reason I keep saying ascorbate is because I mean the buffered form. I never mean the acidic form of vitamin C. And ascorbate, which can be buffered with magnesium, among other minerals, uh, helps by its antioxidant uh, function to uh, prevent or mitigate oxidative stress. What do you do in practice? What, what do you do for yourself or for your loved ones or for your, your clients? My suggestion is to find out if they have a net acid excess. Do they have a risk of metabolic acidosis? And you can check the first morning urine uh, to find that out. And we have on our website a good deal of detail. I generally carry in my pocket a pH paper that we recommend people use, partly because I use it, but partly because it's my show and tell on airplanes and other times when I might meet someone who might have metabolic acidosis, which is actually very easy to do today. Just <laughs> tap people on the shoulder. Tap them on the shoulder. Over half of them will have metabolic acidosis. You'll be right. So we can now test for metabolic acidosis. I do understand if we have no test, it's hard to look at an area in biology, but we now have a test. And there is a healthy range, 6.5 to 7.5. And, and if you're below that, it says excess acid. So you increase the alkaline forming foods and supplements in the diet. And if you're consistently above that, it suggests catabolic illness. And then there are ways of dealing with the... Uh, the uh, destructive uh, effects of catabolic illness. We summarize this as the alkaline way. Aha. Uh -huh. um, we summarize this as the alkaline way. In regard to the first morning urine measurement, you do need six or more hours of rest. I will save you from asking me whether it's okay to get up and go to the bathroom. It is, but it is not okay to get up and be active. So you can get up as many times as you want, as long as you go to the bathroom, and then you're horizontal after that. You go back in bed and you lie there. You don't have to sleep, but you do have to rest. If you're physically active, if you go in the kitchen and eat, if you do things like that, the bets are off. But if you rest for six hours or more, the urine equilibrates with the cells in the bladder and the kidney, and now you have a meaningful measure of net acid excess in a non-invasive specimen in the urine. We recommend keeping a daily log so that people can bring the information into you and you can help them understand it. Routinely, people will come in and say, you know, it's the darndest thing. The days when I'm more acidic first thing in the morning, those are the days when I'm more symptomatic, I'm less energetic, and I'm more irritable. The days when I'm more alkaline, those are the days when I, I'm more optimistic. I'm less symptomatic. So there is a relationship. It's important, I believe, for people to discover this. I don't recommend that you tell them about this. Let them bring the surprise in to you. And then you can help reinforce uh, the message. There is a physiologic pH range. It is small for healthy people in terms of the urine in the morning, 6.5 to 7.5. We do have a little monograph on this, The Joy of Food, The Alkaline Way. And you're welcome to use that. You can pull that off the web if you wish. Or you can purchase physical copies from us. And this is just a way of saying that the blue on the left of this pH scale suggests that excess acid wears you out. The green in the middle is the desirable middle path healthy zone. And on the far right is, in red, the catabolic zone, where the body is basically tearing itself down uh, after surgery or significant stress in life. Catabolic illness is routine. Uh, it is not common to reverse catabolic illness, so sometimes people stay in that state for a long time. And basically, they cannibalize their protein, freeing ammonia, which raises the urine pH above 7.5, uh, which is the sine qua non, or the definition of catabolic illness. So if we want to look at one aspect, say the antioxidant, antioxidant synergists, we would look at those uh, things that work with ascorbate uh, to complex and conjugate uh, these are the 
sulfur-rich foods. These are superfoods, if you like that term. These are nature's detoxifying foods. And for the next few minutes, we're going to be talking about these five very special bio-detoxification, sulfur-rich, alkalinizing foods. Garlic, onions, ginger, eggs, and brassica sprouts. I haven't forgotten about selenomethionine. That's a separate beneficial uh, element. Other forms of selenium do not work well. Selenite and selenate can be toxic. Selenomethionine, much less so. Selenomethionine, highly effective. Other forms of selenium, less so. Selenocysteine is effective, um, although expensive. So if we want to use ascorbate to mobilize toxic minerals, and then we want to uh, enhance the excretion, we would provide selenomethionine. We would also provide what we had in the previous slide, which was the sulfur-rich foods. And there's a synergy between the, thri the five to thrive sulfur-rich foods and the selenomethionine. So the safer form of selenium is selenomethionine. It is particularly effective uh, in regard to mercury. And some of, you, some of you may be aware that about two years ago now in Science Magazine, there was an article about tuna and the fact that the fish who have increases in mercury have corresponding increases in selenomethionine. The selenomethionine and selenocysteine binds the mercury. It stays in the fish, but it's much less toxic when it is covalently bound uh, to these selenium sources. And that explains, at least to my satisfaction, how the tuna can survive the mercury. Because when I saw the levels of mercury that were in the tuna, the tuna shouldn't be able to navigate. It shouldn't be able to have its nerves work. So the, the fish was smart enough before we figured it out to raise the detoxifying selenomethionine and selenocysteine to help reduce uh, the toxic effects of the mercury. Mercury stayed in the fish, but in a less toxic form. So we want to mobilize toxic metals. We want to use and be aware of these sulfur sources because depletion of sulfur sources in the diet means depletion of glutathione. It also means depletion of essential protective sulfur fire-like intermediaries. So if only because we love glutathione, we want to have enough sulfur-rich foods to replenish glutathione stores. We want selenomethionine, but we want it particularly because it uh, works with vitamins E, all eight forms of vitamin E are needed. Selenomethionine and vitamins E are the protective membrane antioxidant complex. So what vitamin E and selenomethionine are to the membrane, ascorbate is to the cytoplasm, and polyphenolics and other antioxidants are to other specialized areas of the cell. So we want the sulfur sources in the diet to help protect and raise glutathione. We want selenomethionine and different vitamin E forms to protect the membrane and other lipids from oxidative stress. Then there's metallothionine. Now metallothionine was discovered by Burt Valley and others, and it's nature's protection from toxic metals. So when you have metallothionine in your urine and your blood and your stool and your spinal fluid and so forth, toxic metals go there first. Metallothionine, to remind you, is a polypeptide. It's made of two amino acids in repeating sequence, glycine and cysteine. Simple amino acid glycine, sulfur-containing amino acid cysteine. And on the surface, bound are zinc and magnesium. So if lead or mercury or some toxic metal comes in, the toxic metal has a higher affinity for the sulfur, the magnesium or zinc is released, the magnesium and zinc is then beneficially used by the body, and the toxic metal is not able to do any damage. It's no longer an oxidative stressor. So metallothionine can be measured. It's not a routine clinical procedure, but can be measured clinically. It is a meaningful predictor of whether the person has natural protection from toxic metals or is at very high risk of toxic effects and oxidative stress from the toxic metals. So metallothionines, we think, are very important but because they've been hard to measure, they've been overlooked. Only when metallothionines and alkaline mineral reserves are depleted first does toxic mineral bioaccumulation occur. 
Now this helps me at least understand why decades ago when I was a graduate student, we could take baths in solvents like benzene, toluene, xylene, and furans. We played with mercury because it made nickel shiny and we rolled it around on the floor. And we didn't call out hazmat teams at the time. We didn't shut down the buildings. And we survived. I think fewer people today have protective metallothionine. I think that's because they are acidotic. They lack antioxidants, so they have oxidative stress. They lack competent methylation. It turns out they're all related intimately. And that's what makes us so much more hospitable or susceptible to the toxic metals and their toxic effects. So we have a national magnesium deficit. This was first identified by Bert Altura and Mildred Selig, among others. But the country, the whole country of America, is deficient in magnesium. If you just look at people admitted to the hospital, what percentage of people at the cellular level are deficient in magnesium? Does anybody happen to know? 68. At least 68 percent. That's the most conservative number. Could easily be much higher, but at least two out of three. So on the way into the coronary care unit, on the way into the emergency room, if you just gave everyone magnesium, you'd be doing them a good deed. Magnesium deficit means metabolic acidosis. So when we talk about these vague conditions like net acid excess, what we're really talking about is a deficit of minerals in the diet. <clears throat> and with metabolic acidosis comes an increase in free radical oxidative disposition. And these effects are 100 to 1,000 times more. The oxidative damage and oxidative stress is 100 to 1,000 times more if the cells are acidotic than if they're healthy and alkaline. And that was published in the Journal of Biological Chemistry uh, in the year 2000. I, I think a very important article, uh, because JBC doesn't normally publish articles of this nature, but it really shows the intimate link between dietarily and stress-induced acidosis and oxidative stress, which means running out of antioxidants because you're not recycling them efficiently. With regard to glutathione, we definitely want to raise our reduced glutathione levels. And here, ascorbate, again, is your friend. Alton Meister, who was a fairly famous biochemist, was right all along. Ascorbate is the most effective way to raise glutathione. So if you have enough ascorbate, that will raise glutathione more than anything else. Now, you do have to have sulfur sources. Glutathione is still a tripeptide. But ascorbate not only uh, helps enhance the reduced beneficial form of glutathione, but it also enhances glutathione synthetase. It enhances a whole series of enzymes that uh, independently and together raise the glutathione levels. So the conclusion is if you want to raise glutathione in the cell, give the ascorbate that people need. That you can find out with the ascorbate calibration. And then know that whatever you find in the plasma, there'll be 30-fold more in the cells like the lymphocytes and other immune competent cells. So, now the new stuff. What, this, up until now, was actually all review. Physiology first, we think, is a easily understood concept. I ask people sometimes, do you want to work with your physiology first or pharmacology? If you're in favor of one bug for every, I mean, one drug for every problem, uh, then you would be on the pharmacology first side. Uh, if you want to get the good stuff in and the bad stuff out, then you'd be on the physiology first side. We work on the physiology first side. Biodetox, I think, is a lifelong process. Uh, I, I, I don't think we'd have much argument in this room about the xenotoxin burden, about the environmental uh, uh, contaminants that we deal with. Uh, and for me, the question is, what are you going to do to correspondingly increase your detoxification competence to parallel the increase in toxicants? Because we know we've got 1,000 times more toxic metal. We have 10,000 times more phthalate. We have 10,000 or more times other um, non-recyclable substances, the PCBs and PBBs and DDE and DDT. And the list keeps getting longer. Uh, Jim Turner, uh, in his very nice presentation, mentioned the fact that most compounds that are used commercially have not been studied. There are 104,000 chemicals in bulk production and commercial use in the United States. 4,000 have been studied at all. Less than 40 have been studied for any interactions whatsoever. That's astounding in the mirage of safety category. 
So what would we do if we wanted to use physiology first, if we wanted to get better outcomes, if we were from Lake Wobegon and we wanted everybody to be above average? Well, what we would do is we would avoid side effects, so we would alkalinize, we would get a healthy low redox potential from enough antioxidants, and we'd have competent methylation so that we could move the DNA and the RNA and the proteins around. To achieve this, we would use daily organic or biodynamically sourced fresh vegetable broths and or juices. And for any of you who like machines, there's a new slow speed juicer. It doesn't centrifugally spin, it macerates, it just kind of crushes the food and very slowly brings about 50% more juice out. Just recently in the United States, it's been in the Pacific Rim for some time, a new wave of juicers and juicing, I think, will hit this country and could be very beneficial because vegetable juices uh, are a very good way to get a mineral supplement, especially if the vegetables have minerals in them. But that does mean you're using vegetables that are organic or biodynamically grown and sourced. Next is a multi-multi full bioactivity supplement. If you go to the standard store and buy the standard dietary supplement, you will get anywhere from 17 to 20 nutrients at the levels to avoid deficiency diseases. If you want to be protected in the 21st century, then you'd want a comprehensive formula, maybe 40 active ingredients and in meaningful amounts, and that's what we recommend in addition to the diet uh, because of the 21st century. You would use ascorbate as antioxidants based on the C calibration, uh, and you would want to enhance methylation through the use of hydroxocobalamin, multiple folate forms, B-complex from B6 to others. Uh, it turns out there are a lot of components in the methylation sequences, uh, but to start with the uh, B12 as hydroxocobalamin, multiple folate, natural forms, uh, and B6 uh, to help enhance methylation. And we'll get to the markers of how to measure that in a minute. I mentioned about the uh, diet influencing urinary pH. We call this the alkaline whey diet. Uh, it does mean eating the kinds of foods that grandma or grandpa might have recommended, uh, and preferably those that have actually been ripened in a normative and usual biological cycle. You want therapeutic amounts of antioxidants. You want soluble minerals. Ground up rocks really aren't very good sources of minerals, even though they're the most common sources in supplements. You want enough fluids, three quarts a day, to wash the toxins out. For those of you who like testing, I would suggest that the skin pinch test is the best zero cost test for dehydration that I know, and dehydration is a common problem. If you take your palm and look at the back of it, and you pinch the skin on the back of the palm and let it go, it should so quickly go flat that you can't say 1-1000. One, one if, if you can say 1-1000 one, one before it goes flat, you're about a quart low. No, you're, you're about two and a half to three percent dehydrated. You pinch the skin on the back of the palm, you let it go. If it goes flat so quickly that you can't count, you have enough water. If, you're, if it's taking a little while to flatten out, you need an extra glass. Those of you who want to can pour a glass and drink it right now, that's quite okay. I actually did this test in front of someone whose name you would know, and I was down, and they pointed out to me, well, Doc, looks like you're about a quart down, and I was. And then we do repeat the provocative depenicillamine test to see if we have gained beneficial and healthy minerals and lost the toxic minerals. So with regard to the bio-burden uh, and detoxification regimen, we want to restore methylation, we want to restore a healthy redox, we want to restore a healthy alkaline pH, and that means daily urine pH measures. That'll set you back about two cents a day. Uh, if you use a pencil, that'll be a fraction of a penny more. Minerals in their soluble form, enough so that you keep that urine in the healthy alkaline zone. Enough fluids so that the toxins can wash out without making you feel punk on the way and therapeutic amounts of antioxidants so that oxidative stress cannot be measured. And then if and only if needed, we recommend the penicillamine twice a week. So we do recommend penicillamine twice a week when the burden of toxic metals is higher. We recommend biological detoxification to start, and very often that's sufficient. 
The reason we recommend biweekly penicillamine is if you give high dose every day, you create autoimmune problems. Don't do that. The, when you give it twice a week, then the penicillamine washes out, carrying the toxic metals with it, but allows the connective tissue cross-linking to go on, and it's the cross-linking inhibition that's the reason penicillamine has a bad name. So don't use high dose every day. Do use it on a pulsed basis if needed. With regard to the ascorbate calibration, if you're a healthy person, you should be able to calibrate by taking one and a half grams, which would typically be half a teaspoon, in say two to four ounces of water, do that every 15 minutes, and within three to six uh, of these doses, if you're a healthy person, you will flush. If you're moderately, moderately ill, we recommend three grams every 15 minutes. And if you're chronically ill, six to 12 grams every 15 minutes. And the reason we recommend that is if you have people do an ascorbate calibration, no matter how well they feel afterwards, if it takes all day, it's too long. So we want to do the ascorbate calibration once they know their approximate needs in about an hour, hour and a half, or two hours. And let's say you were a healthy person and you took four of those doses, you'd be up at six grams, and healthy people will almost all flush by then. If you were moderately ill, or maybe more importantly, chronically ill, let's say you took two teaspoons, which would be six grams, and you did that every 15 minutes, and you did that for two hours. So six grams every 15 minutes for two hours means eight doses, 48 grams. Most people will flush by 48 grams. And if they don't flush by 48 grams, it'll be impressive to them that they have not yet had an evacuation, even though they've taken in 48 grams. Now, cautions. Do not stop in the middle. So if you get loose stool, continue until you get a flush-like evacuation. The reason that we recommend this is the old mechanism, which was bowel tolerance uh, determination of ascorbate need, you would creep up on the amount of ascorbate you needed, and then eventually you would get loosening of stool and maybe diarrhea. But you also recirculated toxins, and so very often people felt worse on the way to feeling better. That was called a healing crisis. I'm not a big fan of healing crises. I find if people feel worse, they don't care why, they're just not happy. And so what we want to do is mobilize toxins and extra third space fluid and put that quickly in the commode. So that's why every 15 minutes we come in with more ascorbate until you saturate the system and you flush out. I had a colleague, a fellow who runs the Dartmouth Health Atlas. He was very skeptical about the metabolic acidosis. He was more skeptical about the oxidative stress. So he went home and he measured his first morning urine pH and it was five. And he called me within uh, two nanoseconds. And he said, am I dying? I said, who is this? He says, you know who this is, am I dying? I'm, my pH is five. I said, we're all dying, it's a question of when, but you're not dying any more than you were 10 minutes ago before you knew the answer to this. These are long-term measures. That's their strength, it's also a limit, but that's their strength is that you can predict many years ahead the development of osteopenia and osteoporosis. You can, you can predict many years ahead the development of chronic uh, degenerative and autoimmune diseases if you know the control mechanisms, the pH, the redox, and the methylation status. So these are, we think, quite fundamental, but because they're physiological, they're largely overlooked uh, in a society that focuses on pharmacology first. The second category in biological detoxification. First is the ascorbate based on individualized needs. The second is to enhance what we can call phase two detoxification. And here you want to enhance cysteine, methionine, and glutathione in the diet. We come back to those five to thrive foods, garlic, onions, ginger, brassica sprouts, and eggs. And if this looks fuzzy, you were out too late last night. No, it is fuzzy. But this is an onion, a red one. This is garlic, that's ginger. These are nature's sulfur foods. If you go around the world looking at healthy diets, looking at the long-lived healthy populations in different regions, one or more of these foods are staples in every diet. So the reason we recommend these five sulfur-rich uh, 
detoxifying foods is because when we went around the world looking for healthy diets and healthy cuisines, these foods, one or more of them, were staples in every diet. You don't need all five. You do need one or more on a regular basis. The third component of biological detoxification. First is ascorbate to set the redox. The second is sulfur-rich foods. The third are the polyphenolics, the flavonoids and flavanols. Now, flavonoids and flavanols are older terms, and I know new terms are sexier, so polyphenolics is what they're being called now. Resveratrol is one of those. Coercin and dihydrate is actually my preference. Coupled with soluble OPC, this is quercetin dihydrate, this is soluble OPC for those of you who are, who are chemists. And these polyphenolics are effective, they're water soluble. They activate first responder cells. Our dendritic first responder cells are our repair cells, they're also our detoxifying cells, and they don't get enough respect. Rodney Dangerfield would be a big fan of first responder cells. <laughs> they reduce oxidative stress, but they are also subject to oxidative stress. So when you run out of, of antioxidants, when you become more acidic, very often the first responder cells, the polys, the macrophages, the endothelial cells, the fibroblasts, the sinusoidal cells of the spleen, the Cooper cells in the liver, uh, glial cells in the brain, every part of the body has specialized first responder cells. They're responsible for repair. They're also responsible for defense. They're very energetic but they're also subject uh, to intoxication and to energetic depletion when they're either acidic, oxidatively challenged, or have impaired methylation. And, and I have come to the sense, uh, along with Dick Deeth and a few others, that these are three intimately related aspects, not three independent uh, controllers, but three intimately related aspects of our biological control. So after we get the ascorbate right, and we get the sulfur-rich foods and the polyphenolics, then we want to enhance mineral uptake. We talked about at least 68% of the population that goes to hospitals needing magnesium. Why is it that we have such a national deficit in magnesium? Well, it's because the people that need magnesium often have a block to its uptake. So we have an ATP requiring calcium magnesium ATPase enzyme that is easily poisoned by toxic metals and biocides and non-biodegradable compounds like dioxins. So we actually have a reason why people are today very commonly showing signs of having an impaired magnesium mineral uptake system and what we did was find that if you combine ionized magnesium and choline citrate, you facilitate magnesium uptake from the gut. And these are probably more easily seen uh, in the syllabus, uh, but this is a representation of the uh, Krebs cycle. So you see citrate, isocitrate, and cisaconitate, and these are cycling around. Um, these are other aspects of the methylation cycle, uh, which when I looked at it on my computer, I could read, but if, if, unless you have younger eyes than I, you may not be able to see that as well. But I do think when you look at the syllabus, you, you'll, you'll find it of value. Uh, if you want the full uh, set of the slides, uh, I believe they will be available on a uh, CD after the meeting. This is just a way of saying that methylation is a cycle itself uh, and that you want all aspects to be present. This includes hydroxocobalamin. This includes folate in different forms. It includes B6, but it also includes things like uh, choline and quaternary amines. And the reason that we include choline citrate is because choline turns out to be important in everything from acetylcholine to a variety of other uh, components that modulate the methylation cycles. Well, we've gotten the redox taken care of with the ascorbate. We've got the Thrive with five detox superfoods, the sulfur-rich ones. We've got the polyphenolics. We've got the minerals to buffer and enhance their uptake with choline citrate. Then we add selenomethionine. Selenium in the place of sulfur, that's the uh, schematic representation of selenomethionine. 400 to 2,000 micrograms a day is what I recommend. Many years ago, I gave a talk like this, and uh, a, a fine colleague got up and said, selenium's toxic at that level. Over a milligram a day, selenium is toxic. Uh, this was Paris Kidd, a guy who I admire quite a lot. And I said, no, 
selenomethionine up to five milligrams a day, up to 5,000 micrograms a day, has been shown to be protective from sunburn, to be protective in a variety of contexts, and not toxic. But selenite and selenate are. Now, Paris was such a fine scientist that that night he went uh, to his room, I guess, or went somewhere, and he investigated. And the next day at the meeting, he said, selenite and selenate should not be taken, but selenomethionine and selenocysteine are quite safe uh, at these dosage levels. After we get the ascorbate for the redox and the sulfur-rich foods for the detoxification and the polyphenolics for those first responder cells and the calcium channel blocker, which is nature's calcium channel blocker, which is magnesium, and the selenomethionine, then we do need probiotics uh, and prebiotics. We need good bugs. It turns out the acidophilus organisms, for example, that nurture other healthy bugs in your gut must be replenished. They don't divide in the human GI tract. They come in through fermented foods. And if you're thinking to yourself, what's a fermented food, you understand that most Americans have a deficiency in fermented foods. The things that bubble, for example, raw sauerkraut, pickles out of a barrel, things that haven't been pasteurized, those are fermented foods. Yogurts and kefirs and lassi, those are fermented foods. Fermented foods are the source for the good bugs, the probiotics, and then there's the high fiber prebiotics that feed the probiotics, and we recommend 40 to 100 grams per day uh, of, the, uh, of the prebiotics uh, and 10 to 40 billion bugs of the good probiotics. The takeaway here is if you have enough healthy bugs, they will crowd out the toxic bugs. And the toxic bugs only, only are toxic in high concentration. So the Clostridia, the Salmonella, the Shigella, name the bug you're terrified of. The genes that produce the toxins in those bugs do not derepress until there's communication between the organisms that they're present in high density. If I say that again in English, if you have a few pathogens in the gut, they won't be toxic. They won't even be derepressing their toxin genes. So if you have enough healthy bugs to crowd out the bad bugs, you can restore a healthy microflora in digestion. But you do have to have live bugs. I know some people say that dead bugs are good for you. I don't know why. They may be sources of protein or something. But generally, live bugs are better, in my opinion, than, than bad bugs. 10 to 40 billion a day. We used to get that number from raw foods, fermented foods in our diet. High fiber, 40 to 100 grams a day. That's what it takes in traditional societies to eliminate irritable bowel syndrome. Sir Dennis Burkett spent 20 years in Africa and claimed that in healthy, what he called normative societies, traditional societies that ate a typical African diet. They would get at least 40 and up to 100 grams a day of fiber, and there was no irritable bowel syndrome. None. No ulcerative colitis, no regional enteritis, none. So to summarize, we want the ascorbate based on individual determination of need. We want the five to thrive detoxifying foods. We want the polyphenolics. We want nature's calcium channel blocker, magnesium, but in a form you can take up. We want selenomethionine. We want probiotics and high fiber. And then, if needed, uh, D-penicillamine twice a week uh, as an uh, additional uh, detoxifier. If I summarize this section, uh, we want sulfur-rich detoxifying foods, one or more of them as staples in our diet. We want supplements to enhance glutathione. That means ascorbate and other sulfur sources. We want the sulfur-rich amino acids, but in the healthy, reduced forms. We want lipotropics, like phosphatides. We want ionized minerals, like magnesium, zinc, but more of them than calcium and copper. We need all, but more magnesium and zinc than copper and calcium. And quaternary amines, the inositols and cholines that are communication molecules, but also build neurotransmitters and a variety of other beneficial uh, elements. Again, to summarize, the physiologic toxic mineral removal uh, is critically dependent upon metallothionine. If metallothionine is present, you're more protected. If metallothionine is absent, you're at risk. And that's because of the nature of the metallothionine structure. 
So we want to determine chronic illness links. This is part of what brought me into the field, and as many of you know, I came to debunk this field and either stayed too long or found too much opportunity. We want to link toxic metals to the accelerated consequence of chronic illness, not just in our own understanding, but in those of our clients. We want to reduce the chance of treatment failure. We want to assess body burdens in cost and outcome effective ways. Increasingly, I find that means self-tests with your help to interpret. We want to practice safer detoxification. I know very few people who are in favor of more toxic intoxication, <laughs> even though that's what functionally we often do. We want to mitigate the adverse effects of toxic metals, and that's what this presentation has largely been about. Now I'm going to reinforce this in part in regard to the ascorbate calibration. Here we start with gradually increasing four uh, QID doses. Uh, the mechanisms are multiple and synergistic. Uh, the flush uh, is seen uh, in oral, but not IV therapy. Um, you can give 100, 200, 300 grams a day by vein, you won't get a flush. The enterohepatic circulation, the splanchnic circulation turn out to be different than the systemic uh, plasma circulation, uh, and that uh, is the explanation. Uh, the ascorbate calibration is not an osmotic effect. It is not an osmotic effect. Uh, you can give hypertonic, hypotonic, or isosmotic ascorbate, you get the same level for calibration. There's no danger of rebound as there is with uh, certain techniques that uh, oscillate too wildly. Um, and there are details uh, in a write-up of the ascorbate calibration, which if any of you are interested, we'd be happy to provide. So calibrated ascorbate is a way of determining how much antioxidant you need to protect from oxidative stress. It sets the cell's redox potential, the electrical vitality of the cell. It protects and recycles. It traps free radicals. If you're opposed to free radicals, you're in favor of antioxidants. It is the mother to ATP. And if you figure out ATP as the energy molecule, then we'll teach you about AQP. So that has not three but four phosphates on it, adenosine quattrophosphate. And if you get through that one, then we've got phosphoenopyruvate. Biochemists have all sorts of tricks. Tocopherols and selenomethionine protect the membrane. Ascorbate and glutathione protect the cytosol. Taurine protects the transport system. Uh, lipoic acid protects the nucleus. So there are a variety of different antioxidants that have different uh, specialized areas of expertise in the cell. The individualization is dependent on whether people are healthy, whether they're just unwell or they're chronically ill. We recommend starting at a gram and a half for healthy people, three grams for those feeling unwell, and six grams every 15 minutes for people who are chronically ill. That's because chronically ill people need a lot. And uh, if you do uh, have people, say, take six grams every 15 minutes, they will at a certain point feel full. They will feel as if they're going to have an evacuation. And then we cut back to, say, three grams or a gram and a half for the last couple of doses. Uh, people can occasionally overshoot. And then instead of having one, they'll have multiple evacuations. And while they're getting rid of toxins, they don't like to go back to the commode serially. I mentioned that ascorbate is distinctive in that it's concentrated in cells 30 times over plasma all the way up to the physical limit. Ascorbate is the central antioxidant, and some of you may have heard that there's concern about ascorbate being a pro-oxidant. Now if you take care of test tubes, we can talk about that because in the test tube ascorbate can be a pro-oxidant, but in the human body it's not. And a group in Milan recently using femtosecond spectroscopy showed that even down to 10 to the minus 15th seconds, very tiny time intervals, ascorbate is never a pro-oxidant in biological systems. So don't be concerned about ascorbate uh, as having a paradoxic effect. What the literature does say is that extensive exercise might promote formation of reactive oxygen species and contribute to tissue damage. Thus, ascorbate radical levels in plasma were assessed by electron paramagnetic resonance, a very sensitive technique to check pro-oxidant action. The results are that vitamin C radical activity remains stable during the whole period. Neither vitamin E supplementation nor exercise had any influence on plasma concentration of vitamin C radical. So you can do intensive exercise and you won't uh, start a pro-oxidative response if you have enough antioxidants present. Uh, Bruce Ames and Balz Fry uh, reviewed the world literature on ascorbate. Uh, they are, in their opinion, the safer and most 
versatile water-soluble antioxidants. This means adequate ascorbate can protect directly and indirectly every part of the cell and organ uh, from free radical damage. So tocopherol and selenomethionine in the membrane pick up the electron, they give it, they transfer it to ascorbate. And from ascorbate it goes to glutathione, from glutathione to NAD or FAD, from that into the mitochondria. And the same electron that the cell battery uses to make ATP energy is the electron that started in the membrane as a potential free radical. When you have enough of the antioxidants and they hand off one to the other, you get beneficial energy production and ATP in healthy mitochondria. We uh, published a first-line comprehensive care uh, some years ago, 2005. Uh, a comment from there is that an essential element of health-promoting lifestyle is eating nutritious, healthy foods, yet food can be a source of exposure to toxins. And current food production methods can have negative effects on environment and consumers. I'd say more, except Jim already filled us in on that. Identifies contaminants present in food and describes adverse health effects from exposure to specific contaminants. The recommendations for how exposure can be prevented or minimized are presented in, in the article, and we have this on the website if you want to pull it down, or if you send us an email, we'd be happy to send you the, the substantiation. We want to individualize intake. Biochemical individuality is as alive today as it was when Roger F Williams first articulated it. We want to calibrate ascorbate, know how much the individual needs. We want to use ascorbate well and individually. Uh, everything else will go better. Albert Sins Georgie said the life-giving molecule is ascorbate. Life-giving molecule is ascorbate. This is actually a copy of his 1932, I believe, article on uh, the chemistry, the chemical nature of vitamin C. Uh, you may know that he uh, isolated uh, ascorbate from Hungarian paprika, and they asked him why. And he said, because I didn't like it in my wife's cooking, and I thought if I took all of it out of the garden, she couldn't cook with it. But that wasn't really the reason. That was a secondary reason. The reason was that when you dry paprika, it stays bright red. It doesn't turn dull, which means there has to be an antioxidant present. And that's how ascorbate was first identified. Individualized repair. If you have acute musculoskeletal pain, you can mobilize dendritic repair cells, but you need these polyphenolics every 15 minutes until you're comfortable, then you take them every hour while awake for a couple of days, and then four times a day. That's for acute musculoskeletal trauma in regard to the use of these polyphenolics and antioxidants. Chronic musculoskeletal pain, you want to reactivate these dendritic cells. Here we'd recommend four of the flavonoid flavanol tabsules with each meal and before bed until comfortable for a week, then four times a day as needed for maintenance. Keep oxidized cholesterol and oxidized LDL as undetectable. They should be zero, indicating you have enough antioxidants. To do that, you might need 400, but maybe as much as 3,600 IU of mixed natural tocopherols and tocotrienols, and from two tenths to one milligram of selenomethionine a day. Lots of details for another time. Details that make ascorbate more effective. I've, I've really mentioned these. These are just for review. They are in the syllabus, but uh, time is pressing us. Uh, Albert St. Georgie pointed out that when we left the jungle, we lost our ability to convert sugar into ascorbate. It's been downhill ever since. Linus Pauling said that the reason he was interested in vitamin C was that after we decided to not blow the planet up with nuclear warfare, he thought there would be some need of survival and ascorbate would be necessary for that. He also said that improving people's health by reducing suffering caused by hypoascorbemia, from which far too many in the world suffer unnecessarily. Only a few enlightened people seem to be taking adequate levels of vitamin C. I hope we are among them. That, that's my editorial. And therefore are in the fortunate position of not suffering from a genetic disorder that we have learned to control with vitamin C, ascorbate, and it's a functional insufficiency. The take-home message is take care of your mitochondria. They're your batteries. They'll recharge you. Nourishment is elegantly simple in concept, yet it's often overlooked at great cost in practice. That mitochondrial dysfunction is increasingly common and recognized, but it's due to acquired, not genetic, reasons. It's due to antioxidant deficits. It's due to, due to acidosis. It's due to impaired methylation. And so if you keep your mitochondrial energy production system uh, foremost in your thoughts, both you and your patients will benefit. 
Together we can find a better way to mitigate, remediate, and prevent epidemics of chronic illness and lack of wellness related to mitochondrial dysfunction. It really is a pleasure to be back and thank you for putting up with me. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, learn from you uh, as well as to contribute to the meeting. Thank you.